Hello, everyone. My name is Mohamed al Kuli. I'm an interventional cardiologist at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. I'm also the deputy editor for Jack Cardiovascular Intervention. I'm very privileged today to host both Dr. Fred Cosimoto from Mayo, Florida, and Dr. Jim Freeman from Yale, who are going to join us today to discuss the strengths and the achievements of the LAO registry and uh, you know pr provide or extend an open invitation to our communities to uh, to take this registry to the next level thank you very much for joining us today so i'll go ahead and get started then uh, mohammed if that's okay uh, sort of with you just to level set everybody i'm going to begin uh, sharing my screen and first of all i want to thank you for uh, hosting this from jack interventions and also to emphasize just what you mentioned that the reason to do this is to get the whole community involved in thinking about sort of using the registry for studies. And I know that both you and Jim will talk a lot about that, but let me go ahead and share my screen and we can begin to sort of level set everybody with regards to the uh, registry. So there we go. So um, again, my name is Fred Kusumoto. The reason I'm here um, is that I'm the current chair of the steering committee for the left atrial appendage occlusion uh, registry. And uh, as Mohammed said, uh, I'm a uh, Mayo Clinic in Florida, mainly because my wife would never let me be in Rochester. <laughs> so here then is uh, the uh, history of the NCDR, which I think is really remarkable. You know, its initial roots were in 1987 when the ACC Computer, uh, Computer Applications Committee under the stewardship of Susan Noble really began to think about uh, sort of the importance of having databases and registry. And, you know, data collection started in the interventional labs in 1992, but really the birth of the NCDR as we know it uh, came in 1997 under Bill Weintraub's uh, leadership and really has just, as we'll see, dramatically uh, improved and increased uh, since then. And these pioneers were really thoughtful and had a lot of foresight into thinking about how valuable this sort of data and information would be. And as I uh, all know on this uh, call uh, and in our audience, the NCDR really is the only large sort of global United States uh, database that uh, is really focused on cardiovascular disease. There are a host of hospital-based registries that people can be involved in, the AFib ablation registry, CAP PCI, chest pain, EP uh, device implant, uh, which was the old ICD registry, which is now expanded, the impact registry, and of course, the left atrial appendage occlusion registry, which we're gonna really focus on today. I would be remiss if, uh, you know, again, the ACC has multiple other sort of ties with other organizations. We'll actually see a tie with the, the diabetes group, but also everyone clearly knows about the STS uh, ACC um, TVT uh, registry. So here then are uh, a number of the registries uh, here that are available. We'll talk about the number of participating sites and cumulative patient records. But since this is a, a talk about the left atrial appendage occlusion registry, I wanted to at least get everyone sort of uh, on the same page with regards to left atrial appendage occlusion and how this really came about and how did the NCDR get involved. Here then is the Watchman approval process. You can see Protect AF and then Prevail, the multiple FDA panels, the first, second, and third third FDA panels. And what I want you to notice is that, in fact, there was an understanding that this would uh, be important and required. And in 2014, under the leadership really of Paul uh, Verossi, along with David Slotweiner and others, I was also a part of this. There was a lot of discussion sort of thinking about this registry in preparation for its approval, really, over the, the coming year to year and a half. And this was a collaboration amongst uh, three professional societies that you see there, Heart Rhythm Society, Sky, and the American College of Cardiology. Also, the FDA, again, this was pre-approval here at this point in time, the manufacturer Boston Scientific, and really understanding that if this was going to be used, uh, in fact, you needed to have payers involved and having CMS uh, involved. This then led, then as all know, to CMS approving this for Medicare patients in February to April of 2016. And really, they did it with a national uh, sort of coverage determination with um, 
the importance of coverage with evidence development. And that's really important because that means that there was additional data and information that needed to uh, be looked at uh, before full approval. And the NCDR was chosen as sort of the post-market surveillance uh, instrument. And so now, as all know who put in these devices, in fact, uh, left atrial appendage occlusion devices have to then be reported uh, to the NCDR uh, if a Medicare patient. So let's go back to this. You can clearly see CAT PCI is the sort of the big kid in the in the room with you know 22 million patient records. <laughs> really uh, remarkable. You can see the outpatient uh, pinnacle registry with 44, 45 million uh, cumulative patient records. I mean, this is a huge number. But let's talk about the left atrial appendage occlusion registry specifically. So this is from 2019. Uh, 667 uh, participating sites with about 130,000 uh, records. But this has increased dramatically, as uh, we all know. So here is data up to 2022. You can see now up to 785 sites. And now we're really up to 200,000 uh, procedures that have been submitted to date. Um, and so we're very excited. You can clearly see that this is an important technology and treatment strategy uh, that is valuable to our patients. We'll talk a lot more uh, later with regards to thinking about publications and that specific process. I've shown you the registries off to the left and you can see the number of publications uh, that have uh, been put forth by each of the registries. So one can see this is a very, very fruitful um, environment for doing really important real world research. The 13 publications you can see from uh, the left atrial appendage occlusion and also for you to know that there are at least 30 projects um, that are currently in uh, progress and again we'll talk a bit more about how this uh, gets um, done and you know sort of the research and publications committee uh, but uh, it, it's really important to for all who are watching this to think about getting involved uh, first of all as you know a hospital site of course if you're putting in these sorts of devices but also into the research uh, uh, and publications uh, community I really just have to thank um, sort of uh, my uh, steering committee members. You can see them there. It's a, a wonderful uh, group of uh, physicians who are throughout. Um, you're you're going to meet uh, Jim Freeman here in a minute, along with uh, Jephthah Curtis, who are our liaisons at the Analytics Center at Yale University, really make sure that this data is done in the best of all uh, fashion. And, you know, clearly, uh, Julie is our um, sort of staff a liaison from the ACC um, for this registry. None of this uh, sort of would happen without her. So we all know to thank her very much because she's really the one who does all the yeoman uh, work. So I'm going to stop presenting here and we can uh, go ahead and get started. Uh, fascinating, you know, history. I, I'm actually stunned by the the increase in, in terms of like records registered in it. I was recently in a TVT meeting and there are now close to 600,000 tavers in this. And I'm thinking the LAO is probably following steps and we're, we're going to get to those numbers very soon. Um, so one strength that I would just like to reiterate before we go to the questions is this is the pretty much the only clinical database that is nearly inclusive of the procedures that are done in the country. So I think a lot of people don't know that and that this needs to be explicitly, explicitly mentioned. Um, so when people are trying to do research related to LAO uh, from administrative databases and other sources, they, they, they need to know that this is your best source for clinically collected database that is inclusive of cases done in the country. But uh, maybe maybe just a little bit of more light about how the data is collected collected and uh, how granular uh, you know our variables are for people who are unfamiliar with the database. I know that it's all uh, posted on the website, but maybe high level overview of how inclusive the data is and uh, granularity uh, concerns. Well, let me uh, talk from the steering committee side and then I'll let uh, Jim uh, really talk about it because he's the one who actually looks at the data, you know, all the time. You know, the, the big uh, thing is, as you point out, Mohammed, that, uh, you know, um, 
we really capture the great majority, uh, if not all, of the um, sort of left atrial appendage occlusion um, sort of procedures here in the United States. And it's also important to note that, in fact, this data is incredibly complete. We are at essentially at 97 to 100 percent compliance for the entire uh, sort of uh, group from inception uh, now. And um, that is actually uh, an incredibly uh, important aspect of this is that we do have full capture of uh, this uh, type of information, which is really exciting. We have multiple audits throughout, really looking to make sure that in fact the data uh, is accurate. This is not only for the left atrial appendage occlusion. Know that there is a huge and very uh, sophisticated mechanism for looking at all the registries to make sure that the data is accurate and um, then is then actionable. And uh, that in fact is done for all of the registries with multiple audits uh, uh, sort of over time for each of the registries. We also, just from a steering committee level, really uh, take a look at uh, sort of what are the changes that are occurring and sort of thinking about uh, sort of what are going to be next steps in the future. And I know that everyone hates to click, right? Uh, it used to be filling out boxes. We have really worked, and this is actually uh, in thanks uh, to Paul Verosi, who led this um, effort uh, early on to really be parsimonious with regards to thinking about this data, trying to get data that is actually clinically important, but also trying to minimize, right, to capturing all the critical data, but not uh, adding uh, work. Jim? Yeah, so just to um, add a, a little bit more. So I, I agree, I think broadly generalizable data um, to the U.S. Um, experience with left atrial appendage occlusion, and that's a really key key aspect. We collect about 220 data elements at, uh, at implant, and an additional 60 data elements if someone has a major complication. And so, um, you know, I think, uh, or, or rather I should say, additional data elements if someone has a complication, and then 60 um, during follow-up visits and whatnot. And so I think that brings us to the second really important aspect of the registry, which is that there's mandated follow-up um, through a two-year time horizon. That follow-up isn't universal. There's a little bit of fall off as we get to the two-year time point, um, but very good follow-up at the 45-day mark, and then good follow-up at six months, one year, and two years. Um, so those are unique aspects. There are a lot of study questions that aren't related to what happens during the acute hospitalization in terms of long-term rates, adverse events, and whatnot. And then we also um, are now in the process of uh, publishing some of our first work using data linkage to Medicare um, and using Medicare administrative claims to be able to capture long-term adverse event rates linked to the registry patients to understand what happens over the long term. So I think really important aspects of this data source are that broadly generalizable to the U.S. national experience, which is really important. It's not sub-selected trial populations. It's, it's really the, the U.S. real world experience. And then we have follow-up to be able to answer a lot of questions about what happens after the acute hospitalization. Um, so I think those are those are really important uh, pieces of the data. Right. So Jim, what kind of uh, some important limitations that we should be aware of when we're thinking about acquiring the data? Yeah. So um, you know, as always with any any registry experience or any trial, there's worry about um, under-reporting. As Fred said, there's um, a pretty rigorous data reporting process. So 5% of sites are audited annually, um, and that th their, their reporting, their self-reporting from the site is then um, compared against administrative billing codes from Medicare. And, um, and we see very high rates of uh, compliance in terms of um, data acquisition. And we're going to um, you know, we're going to publish some of this as well, but we see really high rates of concordance between the two sources to, to gather adverse events. So in general, sites seem to be very candid about what's going on. And I think, you know, the understanding is that a lot of the value to the sites of this is the data they get back to their site regarding their adverse event rates. So we, for example, at Yale, we have multiple hospitals within our health system, and we do AFib ablation and left atrial appendage occlusion at multiple sites, and we get that data back. We have eyes on what's happening at each of the different sites, and if things start to change, or we start to see an uptick in adverse events, we can we can keep tabs on that. And I think that, that quality improvement process is really important to a lot of sites. 
But there's there is, you know, I think there's been some concern about underreporting in general. I think the underreporting is is pretty modest. Um, you know, and then there are methodologic concerns around observational data research, right? So um, we can answer uh, through registry-based um, efforts some really interesting and important questions, but there are other questions that are better suited to um, trials. And I think we're very cognizant of that and try to be very thoughtful about what we can answer um, that complements trial data really well, and then talking to our industry partners and saying, you really need a trial in this space to answer this question and trying to work with them. So I, I think, um, I think does that answer the question in terms of limitations? This is great. I think your last point is very important because we see this with other registries too, right? I mean, we're trying to answer questions that are not really fit for the registry. And maybe maybe we'll, we'll just dive right into it then because a lot of people have uh, contacted, you know, the, either the steering committee or ACC interested in how do we, come up with the great proposal and how, how does the process look? And I think, you know, we started with the data element, but maybe maybe we'll just build on that. And let's say today I am a senior cardiology fellow or junior faculty who is very interested in answering a specific question. Uh, let's walk just through that process and say, you know, one, two, three, what, how, would do, how do we optimize each step? And I know it's all written on the website, but I think hearing from the expert here gives it a different flavor. Yeah, so um, there are a couple avenues to do science with the registry. And the first is that annually now, um, there's an opportunity to submit proposals um, to the uh, NCDR to do science. I think it's valuable first and foremost to make sure that nobody's already done something or is doing it now. So pu published work, is um, is available on the website. And I think that's a first place to start to make sure something's not already been published. It, it is valuable to then talk probably with some of the members of the steering committee or other people who are intimately involved with the registry just to make sure things aren't already in process as well. That can be a little bit harder to figure out. And then to talk through ideas and questions. Um, but long and short, having come up with a great idea, you submitted, um, for the annual deadline uh, through the NCDR. And, um, and then that goes to the Research and Publications Committee for review. It actually first comes to us as a data analytics center to, to sort of assess, do we have the data available to address this question as a first pass? Is this a valid question that we can answer with the data that we have available? And then, and then it goes to the Research and Publications Committee and then a few proposals are accepted um, to then move forward. And then um, those authors are given the opportunity to then interface with the Data Analytics Center. That's us at Yale. We set up a call and then we um, initiate the study and then that's paid for through the NCDR. And so that's a, a really exciting opportunity. You mentioned sort of fellows and junior faculty, people who may not have a ton of resources at their disposal. It's a really nice way to go. The other avenue is that you can if you have I, outside funding, you you can bring outside funding to bear. Yeah, I, think, I think the outside funding, I want to spend quite a bit of time on that, but yeah. I wanted to just double click on something that you said was very important, which is talking to people in the steering committees and flushing the idea out after you have done extensive reviews of published work. Um, so one of the critiques that I hear is that the website is not updated up to the, you know, the hour in terms of process, projects in process. And I think I have noticed that ha that has changed over time and it's more updated now than before. But there is always, you know, a concern that if I take my chances, it's once a year and I submit this and somebody has just submitted it now or, you know, in the last cycle and it's not not provided. So maybe maybe we should as a steering committee for research and publication have an avenue for people to communicate with us people who may not know us personally and they don't really know how to reach out, but uh, encourage people through this you know, avenue and others that you can go ahead and send an email and say, I have this idea, can you, can you help me out? I think we wanna make sure that people feel that, that the process is, is more friendly and it's not behind the firewall. And I'm just, you know, if you agree with that, I think we should, we should, be, we should be doing more of that. Yeah, agreed. And, and you know, I think the only other thing is there are, um, I think things that are published are, are fairly straightforward to find. Things that are sort of in process already, 
um, can can be a little harder to figure out. And so, you know, I think ways of trying to get the word out about that is um, is important. Yeah, and yeah. also, well, I was just people reach out to me all the time. <laughs> yeah, and but the other exactly right. And I think the other thing for people just to understand, sort of generally, not only for this registry but all the registries, there's always a steering committee and the research and publications uh, committee, which then sort of vets, you know, a lot of these uh, sorts of. Um, uh, discussions and, and talks. It, it, for this particular setting, we also have uh, a manufacturer, Boston Scientific, who also you can sort of go through them uh, as it were, uh, thinking about the data they have, you know, sort of access. They, there's a slightly different process, but still it's the same notion where it in fact uh, then is reviewed and de the decision is made whether or not, uh, you know, to sort of go ahead uh, and proceed uh, with, with that data. So that's the partnership, right, between industry um, and the professional organization that not only happens here, but also for uh, some of the other registries. I think that's what Jim was was trying to start talking about, and I think that's a very important one to dive in. I was just going to add one more thing, also building on what you, the, your earlier comment about reviewing published work. I think it's incredibly valuable to go through the tables and find out that you know if something is not mentioned in the tables, it's likely that those data are know either missing or uncommon or you know not do not exist so it gives if you are to submit a proposal go through the tables and in your proposal defend your position and say in the last published paper this is how many patients you had so i think you will have enough numbers because that helps both the research and publication committee and the analytics center as well but uh, we'll just take it from there to the to the other partnerships that i think people are less familiar with the the NCDR can only fund so many you know proposals a year, and we should encourage people to look at other sources. So, can you tell us more about those other sources of funding? Yeah, so I, I think there are really broadly speaking, there are two uh, additional sources of funding. Um, one is having an industry partner that you work with who can fund um, science, and so. I think Mohammed, you you're an example of having published something with some external funding from um, from one of the vendors in this space, and um, and so you know the way that would work is how you often approach a vendor to to do investigator initiated work is go to them and say, I've got this a project I'm really interested in. I think this would be valuable for you as an organization, and um, would you be willing to fund it? Um, you know, and they have a sense of what the costs are. Um, to to fund these projects with uh, with us and in partnership, the other avenue is grant funding, um, and that grant funding you know can can come from industry, but often will come from the National Institutes of Health. Um, you know, theoretically, you could apply to you know to uh, other organizations that have um, that you know that fund science. So you know there have been uh, a number of, um, of folks over the years who've had NIH grants. To work with um, with data from the NCDR, we we are with this registry. We currently have an R01 grant from the NIH uh, to work with the data and to answer um, foundational questions. And so again, people often come to us uh, with ideas, and um, in some cases, we can self fund those projects and fast track them if we think that they're broadly consistent or they're very consistent with. Um, projects that we had written into the grant that we were interested in and whatnot. So I think those are the two broad avenues for funding science outside of the ACC process. Right, and can you elaborate a little bit more about the difference in the timeline uh, of the processes? Because the NCDR review is once a year, yeah. while, while if you have a funding source, then it's on a rolling basis. And that has been both a source of, you know, praise and criticism. So maybe <laughs> you, you, could, you could mention something about that. Yeah. So um, for a host of reasons, you know, there used to be the the proposal cycle used to be more frequent, um, you know, and um, over time we're now down to about once a year. And so if you have a great idea a month after um, the proposal deadline, then you're you have to wait a while and to submit a proposal. Whereas if you were to get external funding, um, that theoretically could start um, if it's a great idea and you have the funding and it's you know doable and all of those things um, that um, can be funded and initiate rel relatively rapidly within you know a month or two once the contracting's in place. The contracting can sometimes take a little bit of time. Um, 
But I think once once the contracting's been done once, so for example, once a vendor's already worked with, um, you know, with the NCDR on this process, then um, the contracting process can be a little bit more expedited and generally goes fairly quickly within a few months. Maybe Fred, can you add any more comments on this? I think uh, I see a little bit of unrealistic expectations uh, among trainees and, you know, even early early faculty that, well, they want all the questions answered by the registry right away, uh, and there is cost involved and there are, you know, finite resources. Uh, so do you have any comments about that in terms of uh, trying harder to get external funding or doing both, or what would you recommend? Well, you bring up a good point. I mean, it's unfortunate uh, that uh, doing research is expensive. Uh, Mohammed, you and I both know that doing research at uh, Mayo Clinic and, you know, sometimes have these uh, costs that are associated with it. I'm sure Jim uh, has the same thing at Yale. Um, they're, 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 the, the issue is, um, you know, trying to think about sort of research questions, things like that, it really is, it sounds like a great idea, really easy, I'll just do a query of the database. It, it's, it's, it's a bit more complicated uh, sort of than that. And, and I do wish, um, I understand people sort of concern and worries and thinking boy this uh, you know just takes a long time we understand that I, I you know not only for the left atrial appendage occlusion but i've spoken to paul and other leaders with regards to the ncdr but nonetheless we have to also make sure that the uh, the data is good valuable um, useful accurate all of those sorts of things to actually be uh, you know to provide actionable information and for those reasons in fact um, it can sometimes take a long time as jim pointed out People will think that there is information that we have at the registry that we just don't have. There are a lot of great questions that, you know, can come up and we just can't answer them. Uh, you know, it's just, you know, again, trying to think about um, those database forms, trying to be as parsimonious as possible. But again, there are just times when that data isn't uh, there. So really, number one, uh, I would just say that this sort of thing just takes longer than most people realize, just again, to make ensure that the data is good. The second, though, is as you and Jim have emphasized, all of us um, really want to make this uh, process as user friendly as possible and actually as transparent as possible. So it's not that, you know, oh, this person got the project because he or she uh, sort of, you know, knew somebody, you know, sort of behind the curtain or the firewall, as you brought up, Mom. And I think one other thing um, in terms of the success of proposals, Mom, and I think it's worth I'm talking about is, you know, you talked about looking at old NCDR publications, and I think it's valuable to look at the old NCDR publications to understand what data we have, look at a baseline characteristics table and not, but also look at the methods and how it's done and whatnot. We see a number of proposals where the methods are pretty thin and um, it's not clear that people have a clear understanding of the analytic process and what's involved. And so I think um, it's really helpful to have a, a, a developed analytic plan. Um, so the proposal itself, you know, you sort of broadly, you, you submit who the investigators are, what your you know, title is, the inclusion and exclusion criterion, sort of wh what your cohort is going to be, because you don't always include everyone in the whole registry in a given project, for example. Um, and then, um, and then, and then you have a, an analytic plan and mock tables that um, can be really helpful for that as well. I think that's a really good tip for people is that if you have um, tables that are sort of mock tables that are not populated with data, but what, what you would pre-populate, that's very helpful for the analytic center and for the reviewers to understand exactly what it is you're trying to address or mock figures as well. So um, I, I think those are, those are some tips and tricks. But one other thing that I'll add, uh, Jim, before, you know, Mohammed, you uh, close and, and sort of talk about this is just what Jim said implicitly is that there's a lot of expertise that is necessary uh, in here. And I, and I really think that um, whenever an investigator has a great idea is sort of getting a team around them, basically, who, you know, can think uh, about the analytics, the registries, answer the so what question if, let's say, you uh, you know, have this uh, sort of data that uh, is out there and really uh, coming together as a team to then when the proposal comes through, it's very complete and it's clear that the competencies are there so that in fact, if uh, funded through, let's say the ACC uh, and the NCDR, that in fact it would come uh, to fruition. 
Jim, what should we avoid uh, to to not kill the proposal in the minute of arrival? <laughs> uh, <it's laughs> um, I mean, I guess I can reframe that. What to what to go for? So I think um, you know, I think trying to make sure that the analytic plan is thoughtful. Um, we've already referenced um, and and complete uh, making sure that the data is available. So, for example, there are some data elements where there's a lot of missingness. And that can be problematic, or or saying, uh, for example, um, if we're asking for ten year follow up, if we haven't yet published and we don't yet have follow up out to ten years, um, you know, you, you have to be cautious about those things. So I think just making sure that we have the data, um, and and you know, I think both looking at the data collection form prior publications, and then talking with people who are um, a little bit in the know, and then the second is just making sure the analytic plan is you know is bomb proof is not is not thin we see and you know it's interesting we see both we see people that are experienced investigators but they just don't know the data well and then we see people who have some understanding of the data but they don't really understand analytic methods and you kind of need need both to put together a solid proposal and the one thing that i'll add is to make sure that it's a uh, clinically actionable right uh, with your question i mean to go backwards right because be thoughtful and creative in, in sort of thinking a, a, about that question that, boy, when we get this answer, um, it, it's going to be impactful at the bedside. And I, and I think that that is oftentimes when I think about this or I think about the peer review process, things like that, it's really getting to that fundamental question. Is is that, you know, is that so what uh, question really answered? Absolutely. And then I think, Jim, when we score those kind of proposals. I mean, we it's not just the analytical plan and uh, investigators, but it's also the originality and the the impact. Of so course. If you say if you have a project that looks great, but really the it's a very inc small incremental value, it's not gonna win over, you know, higher impact uh, projects. So I think that that's think about it as you you know submitting something to the NIH, and it's the same sort of like criteria that that get you know, get these projects vetted upon. Um, so in terms of uh, the follow up, I think that's a very important side comment to mention because I'm not sure if everybody is familiar uh, with this. So NCDR has a great completion rate for in hospital outcomes and short term outcomes. Now things get a little bit different when we go to the one year or beyond one year. So can you just comment on that? Because we talked about that before. Yeah, so there's the drop off and follow up as there is with trials and other things, um, uh, you know, other forms of study. And so by the time, you know, the 45 day follow up is very complete in general. And um, the other thing is, at least in this register, the imaging at 45 days is quite complete, which mirrors what was originally published in a lot of the um, trial literature. The imaging gets um, gets thin after the 45 day mark and then the follow up comes down somewhat. Um, so by the time we get, we're sort of getting down to the 80% mark in terms of follow-up. By the time we get to, you know, to the one-year mark, the six-month to one-year mark, um, with a little bit more drop-off as we get to the two-year mark. Now, again, that's active follow-up through the registry. Uh, we are now doing data linkage to Medicare to get, um, you know, to get claims um, that go a bit further out. And the claims obviously should, if people are still alive, and someone gets admitted to a hospital, the claims should be fairly accurate in terms of billing code. So I think we won't capture necessarily outpatient complications and things of that nature, but anything that brings someone to a hospital will be captured through Medicare claims. So we have a pretty solid ability to capture things through follow-up. Um, and we've, as I said, I've seen pretty impressive concordance between the Medicare data and what the registry is collecting overall. Um, so, you know, I think uh, I think there's it opens up a lot of doors in terms of studying kind of long term follow up questions. But it is important to recognize that just as with anything, there's some loss to follow up in the registry. Again, we're hoping that'll be compensated for um, for questions that that go particularly longer term follow up with the Medicare data. So Medicare is now active. The linkage is active for. Yes. Work. Yeah, yeah. So that's in play. So the the initial questions that can be answered, and this is um, another thing that I think can be challenging if you haven't done this. The first year or two of most of the registries is generally going to be just the in hospital um, data, and then if there's an active follow up aspect, 
that will um, come into play sort of incrementally over time, the 45 day follow up first, then the six month and one year follow up and then two year follow up as enough data accrues because you have to you want to you have to one of the great strengths of the registry is the scale and numbers. And you have to allow those numbers to accrue enough follow up to then be able to study questions and take advantage of the value of the registry to study, for example, rare outcomes and things of that nature. And then the and then the Medicare linkage happens. And there was a little bit of delay with this registry with the Medicare linkage. Um, uh, but then uh, that and, and that was had to do with the pandemic and some delays with Medicare and whatnot. But that's all sorted out now and the Medicare linkage is in place. And so um, I think that's all in play. The two year active follow up through the registry um, and some questions we'll use the registry data and other questions. If we think the Medicare data is more amenable to answering the question accurately, we'll use that. Awesome. Any final comments, Fred, about the future of the registry? Yeah, I mean, just to encourage people to be involved. Obviously, this, you know, there is this incentive to be part of the registry because of the coverage with evidence development. I get that with payment. Now, having said that, though, as Jim implied, there's a lot of value to this information. It's really everyone at the NCDR is thinking about what is the value add that we can bring back, and it really is thinking about quality, thinking about benchmarking, all of those uh, sorts of uh, things that are incredibly valuable. So I'm actually really hopeful for the registry, and actually as other technologies and strategies uh, develop and evolve you know, for left atrial appendage occlusion, I think that much more important because it will help us understand really what's best for the patient in front of us. And really, that's what all of us uh, really strive for. I think I think as we move forward, um, there are some really exciting things that are going to happen um, that can be done with observational data. So we'll have some long term follow up um, questions that will be really valuable to address. And then well, obviously we've got um, newer devices that are becoming commercially available. Um, it's important. I think one thing to note is vendor to vendor comparisons are disallowed in the registry. So direct vendor to vendor comparisons. Um, but uh, you can look within a vendor at sort of trends over time um, and, you know, complications within certain vendors and whatnot. And, and then we can look at broad trends over time as we start to roll this out to multiple devices, multiple generations of devices. I mean, it's a really exciting time in the field. Um, and, you know, with the exponential growth in implants, it's, um, it, it's never been a more interesting time to study this space. So are you hiring uh, more people to your team, Jim? How are you handling all these uh, flow of requests? Uh, it's a really good question. Um, yeah, you know, I think um, it gets to what you were talking about, the cost of doing the science. You know, we have to we have a, a stable of really talented statisticians and data analysts and um, clinicians that we work with, an ever growing list of people around the country, former fellows and colleagues around the nation that we work with. And, um, you know, really enjoy. That's one of the great honors of doing this is the collaborative process of the science and whatnot. So, um, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, been, it's been a growing, um, a growing endeavor and, and it's been really fun and interesting. Yeah, Jim, and I, I would like also to emphasize what you just mentioned about collaboration and reaching out. I mean, you and I met through this process. I had not met you before and I had certain ideas and I didn't know how to optimize the idea. So I reached out and, you know, over time we've sort of like uh, built on this collaboration. So I think that's that serves as an example to the broader community that may clutter your email, but uh, I think <laughs> you've always been available. Do you want to comment on that? Absolutely. I mean, I think, um, you know, and this has happened time and again for us, uh, the opportunity to, to work with people like yourself, Mohammed, and now obviously a friend and colleague. We've served on panels together and whatnot. So, um, yeah, I, th I think that's um, really a, a fruitful avenue and serves as a great example of how this process can bring people together and um, how people can get involved. Just reach out and, and we can try and develop um, science together. Great. Well, I really want to thank you again for taking the time. I know you're both in scrubs. I'm the only one who doesn't look like I'm working, but I'm in clinic today. But I really appreciate you taking the time and educating, you know, our audience about the registry and hopefully we'll do more of this in the future. This will also help make make the process not only smoother for them, but also on the receiving end, we'll, it will hope to increase the quality of the proposals and, and see more fruitful things coming. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fred and Jim. Appreciate it.